Hello everyone. Today I'm going to tell you about this uh, World War I French Adrian helmet and the very interesting research I managed to, to perform into it. So the helmet itself was uh, supposedly found in a flea market in Italy, but I didn't find it myself, so I can't vouch for that. And this happened in about uh, 2015. And uh, before going into details about the helmet, the specific helmet, I'll first tell you a little bit about the French army in World War I and uh, steel helmet development. So when World War I started, this is what French troops looked like. So they didn't have any steel helmets, neither did any of the other armies involved. They had this kepi, and they also had these famous red pants. And everybody imagined that the war was going to be really exciting and you would just run towards the enemies and kill them all and nothing would happen to you. But actually that's not exactly what happened. What happened is that there were huge casualties and uh, the French uh, with their red pants were a particularly good target. And uh, what quickly happened is that the, they stopped making all these, all these uh, frontal attacks, dug in, dug into trenches, and then World War I became trench warfare. And it, once they were in the trenches, there started being lots of uh, head wounds, and it became apparent that it would be useful to have a steel helmet. So the French army, they changed their uniform, they, they, they got rid of the red pants, and they decided that the color would be blue, kind of light blue, and they designed um, the, the helmet, the Adrian helmet. Adrian is the name of the person who invented it. So here you see soldiers in 1915 in a trench with their brand new helmets that were just issued to them. They were issued uh, sometime mid-1915. mid, mid -1915. And uh, they kind of have a funny shape, and the reason for that is that uh, they don't really look like a military helmet, they look like a parade helmet. That's because the helmet was copied off the French fireman helmet, actually. And to be honest, these helmets were not very solid. They were basically hardly thicker than a tin can. And if you look at this guy here, you can see that the visor of his helmet is bent. And you can literally just bend it with your, with your hand if you feel like it. And you can see that this guy here uh, already lost the badge. And this badge is for the infantry. And then this badge here has a grenade plus an anchor. That's for colonial infantry. So every different branch of the army had its own badge. Now this is what uh, World War I French helmet usually looks like, the first models. So you can see it has this very light blue uh, shiny paint. And uh, take note of the chin strap, this is what the normal chin straps looked like for enlisted men. And they realized pretty soon that the blue paint was too shiny, so uh, in 1917 they uh, started painting them darker blue. And all the ones that had been issued were repainted by hand in a, in a darker blue. You can see that there's brush strokes here. And under the dark paint, you can still see the, the original blue paint. And once again, here it has a standard chin strap. Uh, another interesting detail, uh, these helmets were, were made with partially recycled materials. And uh, to hold the leather in place, you had so recycled material. And when they're early helmets, well, what was the French army doing with all those red pants? Well, now it was using them to to attach the leather to the helmets. It was recycling the red pants since they weren't useful anymore. So you see it has this nice nice red color inside. So let's get back to the helmet that we're going to talk about for the research. So the first thing we see is that it has the original light blue paint, light shiny blue. So this is an early war helmet, uh, probably produced in 1915 or 1916. You see it has the, the badge for the infantry at the front, the grenade, it has RF, which means uh, French Republic, République Française. And we notice it has a braided chin strap, not a simple chin strap like the, the other ones I showed you. And these braided chin straps uh, were for officers. And uh, this one has something interesting. If you look at a normal officer's helmet, usually the braided chin strap was simply attached to the chin strap hook that was already there from the factory. Whereas on the helmet that we're looking at, this was field modified, uh, so what that means is that if you could see this exact helmet in a period picture, you would probably be able to recognize it. You could see this handmade thing and say that's the exact same helmet. And then of course, uh, the, 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 the most obvious thing that we haven't mentioned so far is that this helmet is battle damaged, you see. It has a, a hole here, here it has a small impact, here it has a hole, here it has another hole. There's another impact at the back that, that didn't go through. 
So it's been hit by at least uh, five shrapnel fragments. And why do I say shrapnel and not bullets? Well, you can see bullets go very fast and have a regular shape, so they usually make a kind of neat regular hole in helmets. And uh, here the hole is irregular, and plus it's, it's too small to be a bullet. And um, another characteristic of shrapnel is that you have pieces of different size, so the holes will be of different size. And that's exactly what we see here, the hole in the front of the helmet is uh, much larger than, uh, than the other two on the top of the helmet. And uh, let's look at the inside of the helmet. This is where it becomes really interesting because if we look very, very carefully, what do we see here? There's an inscription, okay? And what does that inscription say? It says CO, then you can't read the rest because it's under some filth, and Robert. Then if we look at the back of the helmet, there's another inscription. You can't read it because of the rust, but this is good because at least it shows that the inscription is really old. It's not something added recently since, uh, since all this grime and rust appeared after the inscription was made. And then if you look under the leather in the helmet, that now we have the solution. Now we can read it clearly. What it says is Colonel Robert, and then a number. It looks like three something, three three eight maybe. It's hard to say. So how do I start my research? Well, researching an individual soldier is, is difficult, but when it's an officer like a colonel, well, it becomes usually much more easier to do research, especially if you have his unit written, like here. So I simply typed uh, Colonel Robert on Google, and uh, sure enough, he's already mentioned here on Wikipedia, you see. And what does it say? It says that in uh, 1914, the 338th Infantry Regiment was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Robert. And uh, he commanded the unit, it says, until uh, 1916. And then, in 1916, he was transferred to the 296th Infantry Regiment, and he was killed in action on 30 April 1917. Okay, so we have a battle-damaged helmet for a Colonel Robert of the 338, and sure enough, we find that there was a Colonel Robert in the 338 who was killed in action. So I'm pretty sure this is our guy. Uh, what are the chances that there was another Colonel Robert in the 338th uh, next to nothing? And so now let's, let's research this guy more in depth. So the first thing I did is I contacted a, a historian. I found him on the internet who had written uh, a few things about Colonel Robert. And uh, he sent me the unit history. And you see it says here, uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning, Colonel Robert is uh, severely wounded by a shell when getting out of his command post. So we'll go into more details about that in a minute. This is the kind of uh, death certificate thing. So we see Colonel Robert of the 296th Regiment. And on April 30th, 1917, he's wounded by, it says, um, a, a wound to the head. It says it's singular here, so one wound to the head. And uh, this historian uh, also had uh, pictures of Colonel Robert. So this is him. And I was really hoping that there might be a picture of him with his helmet, so we could see if the helmet matched. But unfortunately, these are the two only pictures I've managed to, found, to find so far. Uh, but perhaps a picture of him with his helmet exists somewhere and will surface someday. Maybe somebody watching the video uh, will know where to find it or might, might have such a picture in his collection. Uh, the historian also sent me this document that's uh, when Colonel Robert was cited for courage in 1914. It says that, uh, I'm not going to translate everything, but basically they, during an attack uh, there was heavy gunfire, heavy artillery fire, uh, men were lying down and getting killed, and he was uh, staying standing up, preventing people from escaping, and then in the end when they decided to retreat, he was the, the last one who left the terrain. So if, if we believe this, uh, it seems he was a, a pretty brave man, kind of typical of the, the officers of, of 1914. Most of them didn't last long because, of course, when you stay standing up in gunfire, what happens is that you get killed pretty quick. And then, um, with all this information now, I managed to get uh, Colonel Roberts' uh, military file. So you can see that he was born in uh, 1860, so he was actually already 57 years old at the time of his death. Presumably he could have gotten to some cushy position, but he decided to stay in the front lines and he paid the price for that. And then you can see his uh, units here. So, um, in uh, 1915, July 1915, that's exactly the time when uh, the new Adrian helmets were being distributed to the army. He was in the 338th Infantry, 
and his rank was that of colonel. So it makes sense that in the helmet, uh, when he would have received this helmet in 1915, he wrote his current rank and unit, which were colonel and 338th infantry. And then uh, later on he was transferred to the 296th infantry in June 1916. And uh, that's the unit he was killed in action with. And he had still kept his helmet in its uh, initial uh, shiny blue um, configuration, which makes sense because officers usually had, you know, more of parade stuff on their uniform than, than, than the guy, actual guys in the front lines. And here it also mentions this cause of death. So once again, uh, died following a wound to the head on 30th of April, 1917. And uh, I managed to find the unit history, and this is good because it's slightly more precise. It says at 6 o'clock, Colonel Robert uh, went out in front of his PC and is hit by an airburst 105 millimeter shell that explodes very near above him. He has multiple wounds that put his life in danger. After uh, summarily binding him, he's evacuated by an ambulance to the hospital in Villiers. Okay, so now that it says he has several wounds to the head, and uh, that makes sense because the helmet has uh, at least three impacts, and we can imagine that these two would have uh, penetrated the skull or at least caused a flesh wound, and then this one might have hit him in the face, or maybe if he was lucky it would have uh, passed in front of his face. And for a small helmet, for a small object like a helmet to be hit, as we said, one, two, three, four, at least five times, yeah, it had to be pretty near an explosion, you see, because to have such a, such a, such a large number of fragments in such a small space, then that only happens when you're, when you're close to the explosion. And uh, people have a tendency to think that when a shell explodes, the fragments go in all directions equally, but that actually isn't correct. You can see that the majority of of fragments go towards the sides. There's a few that go towards the front and back and uh, then you have this uh, this blind spot here, these blind spots where there's very few fragments. And you can illustrate this by looking at a real uh, shell explosion that I photographed in Sarajevo. And you can see that the shell exploded here and here there's a large number of fragments that hit and here there's very few. So you can imagine that Colonel Robert, if he was close to this explosion, he would probably have been, you know, somewhere like here, where there's just a few fragments. And if he had been, you know, positioned slightly differently, maybe he would have been uh, mangled, killed immediately on the spot, and not just wounded like it, like it was the case. Now, after his death, Colonel uh, Robert was uh, awarded the, the French Légion d'honneur, and um, I'm not very fond of, 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 of that medal because it's supposed to be the highest decoration in France, but the problem is that it's also been given out to all kinds of politicians, including uh, famous dictators who I won't mention. Um, so it's a bit of a shame that people who get killed on the front lines for their country end up receiving the same medal as some dictator who comes to visit France. I'm not very... I, don't, I really don't agree with that. And I also found a few other documents, and what's interesting with this document here is that it has the signature of the recipient, in this case, Colonel Robert, which means we can make a comparison of his handwriting on this document and in the helmet. Now, of course, uh, when you're signing a document or when you're writing your name in a helmet, you're not doing the exact same thing, and I'm not an, an expert graphologist. Actually, I know nothing about it. But maybe if somebody wants to, to give an opinion about this or try to analyze it, it can be interesting, see? Robert, Robert. The R does kind of seem to be to be similar, I find. Anyways. Now, all this is just basically official information, but who, who was Colonel Robert, you know? We have this image of World War I officers who were sometimes nicknamed butchers because they would send thousands and thousands of men to their death, you know, crossing over no man's land into machine gun and artillery fire, the entire unit getting wiped out in a few hours. And um, with Colonel Robert, this is where the research really, really turns lucky, is that there's a, a French soldier who wrote his memoirs of World War I. His name was Louis Bartas, and he just happened to be in the same unit as Colonel Robert in 1917. So he gives us a few informal descriptions of Colonel Robert. And I don't have the book under my eyes now, so I made some retranscriptions. And this is what uh, Bartas says. He says that in February 1917, there was accidental friendly artillery fire onto the French lines, and Colonel Robert 
uh, threatened to resign if, if that happened again and if you kept on killing his men like that. And then on April 19th, 1917, so just 11 days before he was killed, uh, the unit receives the order to attack from the general. And this is the description that Barthas makes. And Barthas, I forgot to mention, he wasn't a military guy, he was a socialist and he didn't like the army at all and was against the war. So if he's making these descriptions of a career officer, uh, they're probably accurate. So when the colonel received the order to attack, this is what he said, what, what Barthas describes. Our colonel removed his pipe from his mouth, spat, and without hurry, and to my great surprise, answered in a gruff voice, General, look at these men, the state they are in. The first day they would have marched, but now they will not, and neither will I. So Barthas concludes, Few colonels would have had the courage of responding in such a manner in order to save the lives of their men, but under a tough, abrupt, grumpy appearance, Colonel Robert hid a kind, generous, compassionate heart. He was an elite spirit. And then just a few days later, Barthas sees another similar scene. He says, Colonel Robert had summoned his officers for a conference when a staff officer appeared, shined, polished, and pressed, who was coming to deliver the most recent order. When the colonel had read the orders assigned to his regiment, he hurled himself towards that parade officer and with a voice of thunder shouted to him, Tell your general that he is annoying me. I am fed up of all these orders and counter-orders since eight days. Tell him that my regiment will only attack when the barbed wire will be blown to pieces. Yes, and tell him that if I am bothering them, then all they have to do is say so. And then, as we know, just a few days after this scene happened, uh, as Bartas also describes, April 30th, Colonel Robert was, uh, was killed by this shell that exploded near him, while well, mortally wounded by the shell that exploded just beside him. So that's where the research ends. I didn't manage to find any, any direct descendants. I did manage to find some uh, distant family, but they didn't have any additional information or more pictures. I'm sure there must be a picture of him with this helmet that exists somewhere, but um, I haven't found it yet. I'm still looking. And uh, through this video, I hope to let us all remember this soldier for a few minutes and one of the millions of people who died in, in this senseless war. And, uh, whose story is now known thanks to, thanks to this helmet. And if any of you guys want to do some uh, similar sort of research, feel free to contact me at this email address. Uh, I'm not very good at World War, World War I research. Usually I, I do more World War II. But whatever, if you want some uh, free advice or something, feel free to, to contact me.